The Path to Salvation by St. Theophon the Recluse Part 3, Chapter 5, Dash 3 The differentiating feature here is persecution of the flesh. Persecuting the flesh means not giving it any pleasure in lusts, or not doing anything with relish. It means accepting neither food, drink, sleep, movement, seeing, hearing, nor any other feeling or impression indiscriminately, no matter how good it may be. But accepting everything, as it were in passing, as something foreign, without giving it attention either before or after. Even more, they should be received with a certain restraint, not according to the measure of fleshly desire, but according to the measure set by the reason and good intentions. Give the body what it needs, but deprive it a little, and, leaving it behind, turn entirely toward the soul. The Holy Fathers call this fleeting comfort of the flesh, which is a most dangerous infirmity hateful to God. Whoever pities the flesh cannot have the Spirit of God abiding in him. Satisfying individual fleshly desires and indulging desires sporadically because of inattentiveness and distraction make one grow cold. What can then be said of those in whom fleshly delight has become a law? Fleshly comfort is to the spirit as water to a fire. The flesh is the seed of all passions, as St. Cassian teaches, and as all experience proves, and therefore our persecution of it withers the passions. Whoever pleases the flesh, even in small things, cannot be within himself, for he is within whatever it is that pleases his flesh. Therefore he is not concentrated, and thus he is cold. The soul presses into the flesh and commingles with it, and thus becomes burdened, weighed down to the earth, and incapable of freely viewing the spiritual within the intellect. On the contrary, how pure is the vision of persecuted flesh, how easily it is drawn within, how unwelcome are the passions to it, and in general how alive and palpable is the spiritual life in it. Though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. If the flesh is fortified, it is fortified at the expense of the spirit. And if the spirit ripens, it ripens in no other way than at the expense of fleshly comfort. Not a single saint had an easy life. They all lived austerely in persecution, weakening, withering, and hatred of the flesh. St. Isaac the Syrian considers persecution of the flesh to be a condition for salvation. Whoever pities his flesh stands on a path that is delusive, slippery, deceptive, and suspect. The flesh should be persecuted in all its parts, members, and functions, so that these members may be presented as weapons of righteousness. There are two branches of our physical lives, the animal-slash-soul, the closest instrument of the psychological-slash-emotional activities, and the other, purely animal the instrument of animal economy, feeding and fighting. The first has more freedom and is less bound. The second is bound, more fleshly and more coarse. Related to the first are the senses, the tongue, the movement. Related to the second are eating, sleeping, sexual functions, and various tactile impressions, warmth, cold, softness, and so on. Next are the following rules for persecuting the flesh. 1. Govern your senses, especially sight and hearing. Bind your movements and hold your tongue. Whoever does not reign in these three things is inwardly plundered, weakened, and captive. He is not even within, for the senses are essentially doors of the soul opening from the inside out, or windows through which inner warmth escapes. 2. Show your authority over the senses by forcing them to be attracted to beneficial subjects. Before, they strove uncontrollably toward what could only foster selfishness and a domination by passions. 
Now they must be directed toward that which engenders spirit. 3. Measure the amount of food needed by the flesh. It should be simple and healthy. Weigh its amount and determine its quality in the hour it is taken, and be content. Do the same with sleep. Mortify your sexual functions by drying out the flesh. Outwardly treat your flesh with a sort of hatred, keeping it in cold and roughness, and so on, so that it has no softness or comfort. 4. Having established all this, struggle with your flesh until it is humbled. Once it is used to this modest and rough environment, it will become your mute slave. Humility of the flesh will be granted at last. You should always keep this in sight and strive for it as a reward for your labors. Physical podvigs foster physical virtues. Solitude, silence, endurance, vigilance, labor, patience, and deprivations, purity, and virginity. 5. You should remember that this friend of yours will end up in the grave. They say, do not trust the flesh, it is deceitful. When you come to believe it is humbled, you relax, and it immediately grabs you and conquers you. This war with it continues to the grave. But it is much harder at first. Later it gets easier and easier, until finally there remains only attention to its behavior, with occasional light sensations of fleshly upsurge. 6. For the most enduring success, the law of constancy must be observed in the realm of physical podvigs, if anywhere. Here is some general advice. At first, hold all parts of the flesh to the law of restraint, turning all attention to inner work. When the passions begin to settle down, warmth springs up in the heart. Then, according to the measure of inner heat, the bodily needs weaken by themselves, and great physical ascetic feats begin naturally. 7. The most important physical ascetic labors that persecute the flesh are fasting, vigils, labor, and purity. The last is the most effective of all, and the most necessary. That is why virginity is the fastest way to Christian perfection. Without it, man cannot acquire any strength or gifts. It must only be remembered that besides physical purity, there is also purity of the soul, which can be lost in spite of physical purity preserved to the grave. It is more significant than the physical. Thus, spouses also can come very close to being virgins through purity of soul. A laborer who is devoted to God is aided by grace. Therefore, we see married people also who possess spiritual perfections. 8. The order of external life according to the spirit of new life. Everything related to the ordering of external life according to the spirit of new life can be called leaving the world, or casting out the spirit of the world from the entire course of our lives. I have chosen you out of the world. That is, he has taken us out of it. This is what the Lord said to the apostles. He does the same thing through his divine grace and with all the faithful. He takes his spirit out of the world. Even conversion itself consists in turning the consciousness away from the vanity of the world and opening a new one to it, the spiritual. But what at first occurred invisibly in the soul should later in the life be fulfilled indeed, and become an ongoing rule. Whoever seeks the Lord must remove himself from the world. By world is meant everything passionate, vain, or sinful that enters into personal, family, and social life, and which becomes there the custom and rule. Therefore, leaving the world does not mean running away from the family or society, but abandoning the morals, customs, rules, habits, and demands that are entirely antithetical to the Spirit of Christ, which has entered and ripens within us. Citizenship and family life are blessed by God. Therefore, we should not turn away from them or have contempt for them, nor for anything belonging to their essential good order. 
but everything lustful and passionate that has come into them like a malignant tumor that tempts them should be held in contempt and renounced. Running away from the world means establishing yourself in the true family and citizenship. Everything else should be as if foreign to us, not our business. And they that use this world as not abusing it. 1 Corinthians Why it should be done this way is obvious. The vain, passion-soaked world is inevitably transmitted to our souls and arouses or infuses passions. Just as one who walks near soot turns black, or as one who touches fire gets burned, so does the one who participates in worldly things become imbued with passions hateful to God. Therefore, when the penitent comes back to the world, he falls again, and innocently becomes depraved. This is almost inescapable. The mind is immediately darkened. He becomes forgetful, weak, captive, and plundered. Then once the heart has been wounded, there follows passion and action, and the man has fallen. Witnesses to this whole history of deprivation, as well as witnesses to how necessary and inevitable it is to abandon all of this, are those converts who flee all of these customs as if they were fire. What exactly to abandon and how to do it is taught better by experience than by our writing. This is the law. Abandon everything that is dangerous to the new life. Whatever ignites passions, brings vanity, and extinguishes spirit. And how many such things there are. Let the measure of this be each person's heart, sincerely seeking salvation without deceit and not only for show. Now it is the time to cease from all theaters, balls, dances, music, singing, travels, strolls, acquaintances, jokes, sarcasm, laughter, and idle time. It is even time to change the time of arising from bed, sleep, eating, and so on. At other times and in different places it may be otherwise, but the measuring stick is always the same. Abandon what is harmful and dangerous to life, whatever extinguishes the spirit. But what exactly is this? For some it may be the most petty thing like a stroll around some familiar area with a familiar individual. All things are lawful unto me, but not all things are helpful. 1 Corinthians From this it follows that leaving the world is nothing other than cleaning up your entire external life, removing from it everything passionate and replacing it with something pure, which will not disrupt the spiritual life, but rather aid it. Be it in family, personal, or social life, completely reorder your outward behavior in and outside the home, with friends and associates, as the spirit of your new life requires it. Establish rules and order in every part of the home, at work, with acquaintances, and when, how, and with whom you spend your time. How can this be done? However you can, only do it with counsel and discernment according to the guidance of your spiritual father or someone you trust. Some people do this suddenly, and it seems better, while others do it by degrees. Only from the first minute you should come to hate all with your whole heart, everything worldly and sinful, and estrange yourself from it, not wanting it or delighting in it. Be ye not conformed to this world. After inwardly abandoning the world, visible departure may follow, either suddenly or gradually. A man who is weak in spirit will not bear a long, drawn-out abandonment. He will not stand firm, will weaken and fall. Such ones are especially overcome by passions of the flesh, which are like second nature to him. Therefore, such people should always leave it all suddenly going far away from that place where they wallowed in sin. A man strong in the spirit of zeal will bear it even by degrees, but for the former as well as the latter, it is absolutely necessary from the first moment of conversion to cease all association with the sinful world and everything worldly until the form of new life has been established. This is the same as fencing around a transplanted tree. 
For though the wind be soft, it could blow the tree over because its roots are still weak. The thought that you could live like a Christian while holding on to the world and worldliness is an empty, deluded thought. Whoever lives by this thought will never learn anything more than Phariseeism and imaginary life. That is, he will be a Christian only in his own opinion and not in fact. At first he will destroy with one hand what he created with another. That is, what he gathered while away from the world will be stolen from him at his first re-entrance into it. From this it is a direct path to opinion. For what was stolen from the heart may still remain in the memory and imagination. Now remembering and imagining how it was before, man might think that it is still that way. Meanwhile it has evaporated and only traces of it are left in the memory. He will think that he has what he has not. The judgment upon him is this, but from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he has. Matthew 25. It is one step from opinion to Phariseeism, and hardened Phariseeism is a terrible state. Nevertheless, it is a frightening prospect. How can I leave the world, one might say? It is only frightening superficially while inwardly leaving the world means entering paradise. From the outside there appears only hatred, sorrows, and loss. So what to do? Fortify yourself with patience. What is more valuable, the world or your soul, time or eternity? Give up the small and take the measureless in full measure. It also happens that a strong push away from the world comes only at the beginning, but then it quiets down little by little. And the one who has left the world is left in peace, for people are rarely treasured in the world. People talk and talk and then forget. They think of the one who left the world as dead. Thus you need not be afraid of the world's displeasure, because due to its vanity and pride, it loves what is at hand and forgets the rest. It is a spectacle. It concerns itself with or grasps only those who are within it and has little concern from the, for the others. Thus, whether it be through occupations that strengthen the soul, or by persecuting the flesh with all its members, particularly those closest organs of the soul, or by cleaning up the outer order of life, the person who seeks a good and steadfast stronghold safeguards his inner life, having strengthened himself within by spiritual and soul-related practices and solitude, Accompanied by persecution of the flesh, he goes on to his family, civil or societal affairs, to works that are pure and salvific, according to God's will. And through these his spirit builds, or at least is not plundered. Only one thing can distract him, that is constant looking upon and hearing things that are either worldly or simple which affect his soul distracting it by drawing its attention away and then plundering it. If he would set a guard over these openings, his inner peace would be undisturbed. Obviously, the most reliable and decisive means for this is guarding the senses. But this is not possible, e or even right for everyone. Therefore, the Holy Fathers have invented a salvific method whereby we can be subject to the impressions of external things yet not be distracted by them, at the same time building spirit. It consists in providing a spiritual substitute for everything seen and heard, and to become so strong in the remembrance of this spiritual substitute that every time the thing is seen, its spiritual substitute impresses the senses rather than itself. Whoever does this with everything he meets will always be as if in school. Light and dark, man and beast, rock and plant, house and field, everything to the smallest iota will be a lesson to him. He need only interpret it all to himself and strengthen himself in it. And how salvific it is! Why are you crying? asked the disciple of the elder who saw the beautiful, depraved woman. I am crying, he replied over the destruction of God's rational creature, and over the fact that I do not take such care for my soul as she does over her body for destruction. Another, hearing the weeping of a woman over a grave, said, 
so should a Christian weep over his sins. 9. Grace-filled means of developing and strengthening the spiritual life. Such are the ascetic labors by which the soul, the body, and our external behavior develop in accordance with the spirit of new life. After the spirit is enlivened by the grace of God at conversion, it ascends to resolve and promise and seals the grace with the holy mysteries. But just as at the beginning conversion is unreliable if it is not sealed by grace through the sacraments, so does zeal continue to be unstable, fervor powerless, the will weak, and life empty without renewal through the divine mysteries of confession and holy communion. Christian life manifested by zeal is grace-filled life. Thus the attraction and acquisition of divine grace is the most powerful means of persevering, feeding, and kindling Christian life. There are special elements that feed our animal nature, and there are elements that feed our spiritual life. The second elements are the sacraments. The Lord has given us the sacrament of his body and blood for the purpose of feeding and elevating our spiritual life. I am the bread of life, said the Lord. My flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. Spiritual life is the result of being with the Lord. There is no true life outside of him or without him. But he says, He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me and I in him. I live by the Father, so he that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me and I in him. That means that communion with the Lord works through communion of his body and blood. True spiritual life is powerful, productive, and prolific. But without me, says the Lord, you can do nothing. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. He that eats me, even he shall live by me. Therefore, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. This is the grace-filled source per, for preserving and strengthening our spiritual life. That is why, from the very beginning of Christianity, true zealots of piety considered frequent communion to be the chief blessing. In the Acts, it appears everywhere. Christians all abided in prayer and the breaking of bread, that is, communion. St. Basil the Great in his epistle to Caesar said that it is salvific to partake of the body and blood every day and said of his own life, we receive communion four times a week. This is also the opinion common to all the saints, that there is no salvation without communion and no progress in life without frequent communion. But the Lord, the source of life that enlivens those who partake of him, is also fire to those who eat him. Those who receive communion worthily taste of life, but those who partake unworthily taste of death. Although this death does not occur visibly, invisibly it always occurs in the spirit and heart of the man. The unworthy communicant steps away like a charred log from the fire, or the metal remnants of a conflagration. In the body itself either the seed of death is sown, or death happens right away, as it was in the Corinthian church at the Apostles' reprimand. Therefore, when receiving communion, you must approach it with fear and trembling and sufficient preparation. This preparation consists in cleansing the conscience of dead deeds. But let a man examine himself, teaches the Apostle, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Confession made with hatred of sin and the promise to flee it in any way possible makes a man's soul a vessel capable of containing the uncontainable God by his grace. Decisiveness and promise are the place where the Lord communes with us in communion, for it is the only clean place in us. Everywhere else it is, in us it is unclean. Therefore, no one approaches worthily, but only through the Lord and his grace are we deemed worthy. For the sake of compunctionate confession and promise. We could have limited it to this. Confess worthily and you will be a worthy communicant. But confession itself is a sacrament which requires worthy preparation 
And more than that, it requires particular actions, feelings, and dispositions that cannot be summoned all at once, but require time and a certain amount of exclusive preoccupation. That is why it has always been conducted according to a known office, with preliminary deeds and exercises that prepare one for it and enable one to better recognize his sins, to awaken contrition over them, and to guard the fortress of promise. All of these things together, compromise, governé. So, for the elevating and strengthening of grace-filled life through the sacraments, it is necessary to institute governé with all its components, to go to confession, and having thus prepared yourself to worthily partake of holy mysteries. It is necessary, that is, to institute governé, or rather take it upon yourself, for it is already instituted for us by the Holy Church. Four fasts are established to the same, so that during them zealots of piety would prepare themselves, confess, and receive communion. Those seeking perfection should make it a rule for themselves to prepare for communion four times per year, during all the great fasts. This is written in Orthodox Confessions. Incidentally, this should not stifle any zeal for receiving more often or even constantly, neither should it burden like a yoke anyone who is unable to fulfill it due to his circumstances. Just try to do anything within your powers to prepare for communion four times per year. For lay people, four times per year is a modest amount, moderate, and in the experience of many, very salvific. He who does this will not set himself apart from others, and therefore will not get puffed up for being more exalted than they. You can also prepare twice during the Nativity and Great Lenten fasts, at the beginning and the end. This will make in all six times. Gavane should be distinguished from fasting, or worthy conduct of the fasts according to the rubrics of the Church. It is part of the fast but is stricter with respect to food, sleep, and everything else concerned with other pious occupations, such as ceasing worldly cares and affairs, reading holy books as much as possible, full attendance at church services, and so on. This time is generally dedicated exclusively to pious occupations that are all directed toward bringing forth needed repentance and confession, and then the receiving of communion. Thus it is clear that the whole process of governing is the cleaning up of our whole life, renewing its tone, purifying our goals, uniting with the Lord, renewing the Spirit, and all our existence. It is like washing out our dusty clothing or taking a bath after being on the road. A Christian will never be able to keep from getting dirty on the road no matter how careful he is. He gets covered with the dust of passionate thoughts and stained with falls into sin. Even though it be but a little dirt, it is the same as dust in the eyes or grit in a watch. The eyes do not see and the watch does not run. So we have to clean ourselves off from time to time. How wisely it is all set up in our church and how salvific it is to humbly submit to this institution. This is the meaning of governing. It is a means for nourishing and kindling and preserving life in us. But mainly it is the acid assiduous assessment of our lives and our falls with their causes, and the establishment of methods for avoiding them. When sins become known, they are cast out of the heart by contrition and aversion, and cleansed away by confession with the promise to change. Then the vessel is ready. In communion, the Lord comes and communes with the worthy spirit, which should feel that I am not alone, but with thee. End of chapter 5